Hi everyone, my name is Todd Wild. I'm director of uh, technical computing and HPC from Mellanox Technologies. I want to thank the HPC Advisory Council for having me here. I have a couple presentations uh, throughout the the sessions. Um, this one is called 3D Taurus for InfiniBand. I was going to talk for an hour about some advanced technologies and in InfiniBand and my presentation got chopped in half. So I, I took this part uh, out of it. So it should be around a half hour, uh, hopefully. Um, the timing will work out. So before I go into what a 3D Taurus is and, and how it works over InfiniBand, I just wanted to talk about network topologies in general. You know, one of the, the nice things about InfiniBand is that it's very flexible and it supports a number of different topologies. So we can support uh, fat tree based topologies, mesh networks, or 3D Taurus topologies. Now, if I look at the difference between these topologies, a fat tree, um, which is represented here, can be uh, fully non-blocking, one-to-one -one ratio, meaning that whatever type of traffic I'm going to deliver from my servers, uh, I can always get full bandwidth between those servers. Um, so typically a fat tree can have the best performance, uh, it has non-blocking bandwidth and the lowest network latency. Now when I look at meshes or 3D toruses, those are blocking networks, but they can be very cost effective for systems at scale. Uh, they also are a great performing solution for any applications that have locality. Um, they have support for dedicated subnetworks, and they, they have a simple expansion for future growth, which I'll show you about in a little bit. Please interrupt me if, uh, if you have any questions as I go through this. Okay, so what is a 3D Taurus topology? I think it's easiest to look at a 3D Taurus by first looking at it in two dimensions. You can kind of get your head wrapped around it a little better. So if I look at it, a 3D Taurus or a 2D torus is basically two dimensions, X and Y, of a bunch of different nodes. And we'll, we'll explain what these nodes are a bit, little bit later. So the nodes talk to each other by communicating in the X direction and then up in the Y direction. They also have a unique feature that, that it wraps around. So if I'm here, I don't have to go all the way through this. I can just kind of wrap around and go, go here to the, the least, uh, the minimum hop. Now, to make this 3D, I simply just stack these up in the Z direction, and I connect them all together. So now I have three dimensions to go X, and then Y, and then Z to get to any three switch nodes. Now, what do these nodes look like? Basically, they, they, they're, it's very flexible what they can look like, but uh, in the clusters that I'm going to talk about, each of these nodes is a 36-port switch. And I hang a number of server, compute servers off of this switch, and then I, I can also hang storage off of each one of these nodes. And then I run a number of links in the X direction, in the Y direction, and in the Z direction on each node. So some of the benefits of this 3D torus, um, it allows for linear expandability without recabling. So with a fat tree, if I want to add a bunch of, of uh, servers, a lot of times I'll have to recable the whole fat tree. With 3D torus, I can simply unconnect one of the ends, add, uh, add, add more uh, nodes, and then reconnect it back up. Um, it's, it allows for simple wiring using shorter cables. I mentioned it works well for localized communication. Uh, at times it provides lower costs, power, and cooling because it has fewer switches and, and cables. Um, it, we, we have the ability to connect storage into each of these cube junctions, and it's also fault tolerant with the ability to handle multiple link and switch failures, which I'll explain when I go into the routing algorithm. It also has built-in support for adaptive routing, congestion control, and QoS. So a lot of these same features that I get with FatTree, I can also get with 3D Taurus. So before I explain the, um, the algorithm that we use for this 3D Taurus implementation uh, over InfiniBand, I need to explain something called credit loops and deadlocks due to these credit loops. So here I have a, a, a looped network. And whenever I have a looped network, um, with, with uh, link level flow control, I have the ability to, to have a deadlock situation. So here I have a, a loop, and I have the, uh, a, a, a black packet that's going to go into this buffer and then be switched into this buffer and then out, the red one this path, and the green one this path. So what happens? Let's, everyone's going to send at once, and I've just consumed my buffer. I've got a deadlock situation now because this green can't get out, 
because the black's there. The black can't, the red can't get out because the green's there, and the black can't get out because the red's there. So we're completely deadlocked. So this is what can happen when you, whenever you have a loop. Well, guess what? I have a big fat loop in my torus. Okay, so that's something I need to deal with. So there's an algorithm that's been developed called Torus 2 QoS, um, and it has been developed to be able to deal with these, uh, these loops. And how does it do that? So basically, let's look at just um, my X direction. Um, what, what, it, what the algorithm does is it draws what it's called a date line. And it draws this date line all the way through all of the, the X uh, coordinates. Now, if a, if a packet crosses the date line, I, I, re, um, I use a particular service level. And if it doesn't cross the date line, I'd use another, another service level. So what that means is in InfiniBand, I have, I have something called virtual lanes. And each of these virtual lanes have their own dedicated set of buffers. So as I go through the network, virtual lane 0 has its own set of buffers, virtual lane 1 has its own set of buffers, VL2 has its own set of buffers, etc. So what I do is if I cross the date line, I use one VL. VL0. If I don't cross the date line, I use another VL, VL1. So this means that there's only one particular set of buffers that cross that date line, which breaks, breaks my loop. So the, the algorithm is based on dimension order routing. What that means is you always go in your X direction first, then you go in the Y direction, then you go in the Z direction. It uses a service level bit for each of the radix to di dictate the virtual lane it's using. So I use service level bit 0 for my X, service level bit 1 for my Y, service level bit 2 for my Z. And so what I do is I build up my service level by saying, OK, if I cross the, the date line in, in X, set this to a 1. If I don't cross it in Y and Z, set those to zeros. So it determines what service level I use as I go through my, my uh, fabric. So for three radix torus, how many do I use? I use three bits, so I use eight service levels. Okay, and two separate virtual lanes. I always use VL0 or VL1. So InfiniBand sp supports up to 16 service levels. Okay, I'm using eight. So what this allows me to do is take eight service levels for one level of QoS and then eight service levels for another level of QoS. So that's where I got the name Taurus to QoS. Um, I could put my compute traffic on one layer of QoS, say service levels zero through seven, and then I could put all my storage traffic on the other. Um, and then that keeps those, those traffics completely separate from each other. Um, the algorithm also allows for rerouting around multiple link faults and switch faults without changing the SL. So that's very important because it's the application that picks the SL. So when I'm going from one node to another, I need, I, I need to find out what SL to use. And then once my application, like MPI, starts using that SL, I don't want to change it. If a link gets pulled, I want to keep the same SL. I don't want the application to die and the MPI to have to restart. So let's look at, at how we do that. Let's look at a link failure example. Yeah, there's something in, in, in InfiniBand called a subnet administrator. And the subnet administrator has all the information on all the connections within the fabric. OK, so the subnet administrator knows if you're, and he gets the information from the subnet manager. It's, it's all kind of in the same program. So if the, the subnet administrator knows if I'm going from this node to this particular node, use SL5, for instance. And then when MPI sets up the, its job, it actually uses, it queries the, the subnet administrator to get all of the path information. So the MPI knows which SL to use, and he programs that into his connection. So a uh, link failure example. Here I'm, I've got a node hanging off of, of a, a server hanging off of this node, and I'm going up here to this one. So I go in my X direction first, then I go in my Y direction. So say like I, this, if this link gets cut, now I have to reroute. So basically, I reroute around this way. Okay, say like the date line was here. 
before I wasn't crossing the date line, so I would have maybe gone over SL0. Now all of a sudden I'm crossing the date line. I don't change my SL. How do I get away with this? Well, since the link broke already, that broke my loop. So I, I, all of a sudden the, the, the need to go over a particular virtual lane to break the link kind of th went out the window because my link already broke uh, by pulling this link. Um, so I can reroute without changing the SL um, and I can handle multiple link failures this way. Now let's look at a little trickier uh, um, error condition when I lose a switch, when I completely lose a switch. Now my switch went away. I can't get through there. So what do I have to do? is I have to route up this way and over. So now I have to change, I don't have to change my SL because I don't, I don't want to. I want to keep my application the same. So how does this work? Basically, there's a unique feature in InfiniBand uh, that allows the capability of mass mapping the SL to the VL based on input-output port combination. So that's how I, I work normally. I, my SL is zero, I map it to VL zero. My SL is one, I map it to VL one. Um, in, in this case, my switch detects a illegal turn. There's actually a legal turn here because I'm going from Y to X. If you remember with dimension order routing, it's always X, Y, and Z. All of a sudden, I've got an illegal turn. So the routing algorithm is smart enough to program in this switch if there's any illegal routed tur turns, it must be because he's trying to vo recover from this condition. So in that case, he goes and uses a completely another VL to be able to, to break the, uh, to avoid the loop potentials. So it's kind of a, a, a tricky feature in the, uh, in the algorithm, and he's able to do that because of this unique capability in InfiniBand. So to, to wrap up the algorithm, uh, Torus to QoS is expandable without recabling, simple wiring. Uh, it's fault tolerant with the ability to handle multiple link and switch failures, and it provides two QoS levels. Um, it's GA'd in Mellanox OFED, and it's being used in production on multiple clusters. Um, Sandia Red Sky, which is a very large 3D torus, is using torus to QoS. And then a, a, a very recent cluster, it was just on the top 100 list, uh, last supercomputing, is this, the uh, San Diego Supercomputing Gordon cluster, uh, which is also using the torus to QoS in the Mellanox OFED stack. <clears throat> Yeah, it'll, it'll put it back to normal. And the SL can stay the same. So the key is the SLs never change. Once this comes online, then the subnet manager recognizes that it's a got a, a Taurus back again and it'll put it back. It wants to put it back because it doesn't want to keep this like this in case another one goes. So it, that's why it wants to put it back. So some of the network properties, if you're building your 3D torus, you want to calculate what some of the, uh, the network properties of it are. Um, to, 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 to calculate latency, uh, worst case latency is one plus the X dimension number of nodes divided by two plus Y dimension divided by two plus Z dimension divided by two. That's the number of switch hops. Um, worst case switch hops from any server to any server. So for example, a four by four by four torus um, has a maximum of seven switch hops, two plus two plus two plus the one. Uh, bisectional bandwidth, it's 2K square, where K is the switch nodes in any of the X, Y, or Z directions. If this is uneven, then you take the worst case of two times X times Y nodes, two times Y times Z, or two times X times Z. Um, and then we have very flexible switch node configurations. Um, the example I showed earlier was actually using 18 uh, links to the servers and then three links to all of the, the uh, six directions. But you could, for instance, uh, do 12 servers and then have four links in every direction as well. It's kind of however you want to mix and match your, the servers that you're supporting down here to how much bandwidth you want on your links. It's very flexible. The, the constraint is this is a 36 port building block. So some cabling techniques, if you are going to build a torus, um, some of the things you're going to want to do. First, it's recommended to name switch nodes by their geographical location within the torus. 
So for example, switch XYZ or switch 010 or switch 003, depending on where it sits on its coordinates. Um, it's also recommended that each direction on a switch node use the same ports. For example, I, on my, my plus X direction, I should always use ports 1, 2, and 3. And in my minus X direction, I always use 4, 5, and 6, etc. So whenever I'm going to do this connection, switch 000 to, to 100 would always be ports 1, 2, and 3 connecting to port 4, 5, and 6. And then 4, 5, and 6 go to 1, 2, and 3 of the, the other side. So you kind of keep it always consistent. It's very easy then to go look at your topology and see that everything's built correctly. Um, another neat trick is, is, is one thing people worry about is as they're building these toruses, especially when they have very long uh, radix in a certain direction, is you can have a short cable, short cable, short cable, short cable, short cable. You get to the end, you have to have a really long cable. Okay? So one of the, the classic ways of, uh, of avoiding this uh, long cable at the end is to cable the switches in every other order. So, for example, if I have a 6 array uh, uh Taurus in the X direction, I can cable 1 to 3, 3 to 5, 5 to 6, 6 to 4, 4 to 2, and then 2 back to 1. They're, right, they're close to each other. So everyone max is only two, two, two hops away or two nodes away physically distant. So I wanted to just show you a quick example of a 3D Taurus. This is the, um, the San Diego supercomputer cluster, Gordon. Basically, it's a four by four by four torus. So every one of these connections is a is a 36 port switch. Um, four four four. I have 18 servers. Actually, the way that, that Gordon is configured, they have 16 compute nodes and two I/O nodes hanging off of every single one of these. Um, and so they 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 built this up. It's 64 switches. They actually built two rails, so they have two dual, it's a dual rail cluster. They have dual port, or two HCAs in every server, in every Sandy Bridge server. Um, each HCA is connected to a separate 3D Taurus cluster. Um, so there's, it's four by four by four, so that's 64 of these nodes, times 18 is, uh, I think it's 1152, um, if I'm not mistaken. 1,152 ser uh, servers connected in this Taurus. Okay, that's all I had. Is any questions?